begin with breaking news from Niger, where a group of soldiers claim to have overthrown the democratically elected president, Mohamed Bazoum. They've declared the closure of Niger's borders and imposed a nationwide curfew. Ferdia Car begins our coverage. Detained by the men meant to protect him, Niger's presidential guard surrounded Mohamed Bazoum's residence early on Wednesday. Amid the uncertainty, supporters of the president came out to protest. No one knows what's going on. We all woke up this morning and heard that someone had decided to take the president hostage and try to make him resign. It's impossible. Everyone has come out to show their discontent. Soldiers fired in the air, sending protesters running. There was apparent hope from the presidency and the West African bloc ECOWAS that a solution could be mediated. Hours later, in a broadcast on national television, military officers announced the removal of President Mohamed Bazoum. We, the Security Defence Forces, gathered at the National Council for the Safeguard of the Homeland, have decided to put an end to the regime you know. This follows the continuous deterioration of the security situation and poor social and economic management. We affirm our support to all commitments undertaken by Niger. ECOWAS, the African Union and the United States have demanded President Bazoum's release. I spoke with President Bazoum uh, earlier this morning and made clear that the United States resolutely supports him as the democratically elected president of Niger. We call for his immediate release. We condemn any effort to seize power by force. Frustrations around unrest and armed rebellions in the Sahel region have been a driving force for coups there. Niger's neighbours, Mali and Burkina Faso, have seen four military takeovers since 2020. Western forces, especially France and the United States, have since increasingly relied on Niger as a base of operations against armed groups in the Sahel. They'll hope to see Niger remain a democracy, along with Mohamed Bazoum's supporters, who voted him into power just two years ago. Ferdi Akar, Al Jazeera. Ahmed Idris says there were several signs of trouble for Mohamed Bazoum since he came to power. Bazoum had his work cut out for him from day one. He was an influential member of the last administration. He campaigned vigorously uh, and won the election in 2021. But again, in 2021, the danger signs started showing. Bazoum is coming from a minority Arab tribe in Niger. And then taking power away from an established tribe that dominated the military, the civil service, and the business was a very, very difficult thing for people. And so there were several indications that this may not end well for him, and it may not end well for his government, I mean, running its full course. And we started seeing this probably since uh, 2021, when Mohammed Yusuf was still in power. That was the time Bazoum was elected and he was declared president. And there was opposition against him. Uh, of, of, of people were thinking that there will certainly be a coup one way or the other. But he lasted two years, actually. So he faced challenges. He inherited the Boko Haram insurgency, the worsening situation on the border with Mali and Burkina Faso. So those were critical issues that define what the uh, coup leaders were saying in their statement uh, this evening, saying that Bazoum has failed to rein in the security challenges in Niger and also the economic challenges facing the people in that country. But again, if you look at Niger, you understand that this is a poor country that has been struggling for decades in terms of the economy, in terms of security, in terms of even feeding the ordinary person on the street. Niger has faced several environmental challenges, climate challenges, and is still facing them. And people are, are, are curious to know how the military will solve those problems. They are accusing Bazoum of failing to uh, solve. West Africa's main regional and economic bloc, ECOWAS, had earlier said that the president of Benin is heading to Niger on a mediation mission. The UN, the African Union and the US have called for the immediate release of President Bazoum. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken spoke a few minutes ago about the political crisis unfolding in Niger. We are very closely monitoring the situation and developments in Niger. Um, I spoke with President Bazoum uh, earlier this morning and made clear that the United States resolutely supports him as the democratically elected president of Niger. 
we call for his immediate release. We condemn any effort to seize power by force. Uh, we're actively engaged with the uh, Niger government, uh, but also with partners in the region and around the world. We'll continue to do so until the situation is resolved appropriately and peacefully. Mike Hanna reports now from Washington, D.C. The White House, the State Department, and indeed the Pentagon have been closely monitoring the situation. There's deep concern in the United States about the situation in Niger. It is described as a critical partner of the United States. Now, there are some 1,000 U.S. forces stationed in that country, some of them special forces units who've been training the Nigerian military, but there's also a massive drone base in the north of the country, which is used to police the movement of militants allied to Boko Haram or Al-Qaeda. So great concern within the United States, also the awareness of what happened in Niger's neighbors. Uh, their military coups in Mali and Burkina Faso resulted in an invitation to Russian-backed forces to come into the country. This is something that the U.S. would not like to see in Niger, which is regarded as its last standing ally in the region. Now, the Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, held a telephone conversation with President Barzoum during the course of the day. He's in Wellington, New Zealand. He says that he offered his unwavering support to the Nigerian president. However, what form the support will take in the days and weeks ahead is unclear. Mike Hanna, Al Jazeera, Washington. West Africa has seen a series of military takeovers and attempted coups in recent years. In August 2020, the Malian army ousted the president, Ibrahim Boubacar Kaita, after a wave of anti-government protests. Three years later, the military is still in power. In September 2021, the soldiers in neighboring Guinea overthrew President Alpha Conde. It followed a disputed election in which he had been vying for a controversial third term. In Burkina Faso, two coups took place in a matter of months in 2022. Army Captain Ibrahim Traoré is currently in control there. And also last year in Guinea-Bissau, 11 people were killed in a failed coup in February. Let's bring in Cameron Hudson now. He's an analyst on African peace, security and governance issues. He's also former director of African affairs at the National Security Council at the White House. He joins us from Durham, North Carolina. Welcome to the program. So still a developing situation here, but nonetheless, how worried will the U.S. administration be over what's happening? Well, I think they're going to be very concerned. As you mentioned before, there's over a thousand U.S. Uh, military personnel in Niger right now conducting counterterrorism operations as well as training the Nigerian military. We have two drone bases uh, operating there, which, which uh, surveil the entire Sahel region. Um, but more importantly than that, I think it was the last remaining democratic state in the entire region. You mentioned the number of coup d'etats that had uh, taken place in the last few years in neighboring states. Uh, we've seen Secretary Blinken, the very first Secretary of State ever to travel to Niger, did so only three months ago, promised more than $150 million in humanitarian assistance and political support. And so I think there's a real question that Washington has to be asking itself right now, if after all of this money and attention and engagement and assistance, if we cannot keep Niger on a democratic path, then what are we doing wrong? But we've seen recent military upheavals in, in neighboring countries, haven't we? To what extent have insurgencies like ISIL in the region fueled uh, military discontent? Well, I think we can't rule out the fact that, you know, it was the military that c carried out this coup um, and that they have been on the front lines of combating uh, these terrorist elements that have been spreading across uh, the Sahel region. Um, now, Niger was not the most... Uh, worrisome case. It was not the most beset uh, by that terrorist threat. Burkina and Mali have seen far greater uh, death tolls and civilian uh, casualties related to those conflicts. But nonetheless, I think there was a certain degree of uh, discontentment uh, within the military. Uh, clearly, there's been some speculation that perhaps they haven't been receiving uh, the training that they want or the supplies and the material that have been promised to them. It's hard to say exactly uh, what their grievances are. They've been 
been very uh, murky about it, just saying uh, that it's the political situation, the socioeconomic situation, and the security situation in the country that caused them to carry out this coup. So that's not a lot to go on, given that it's everything. The U.S. says it gives unwavering support to Mohamed Bazoum, but in practical terms, how far will that support go? Well, again, I think we've seen Washington trying to rally support not only uh, from its, from itself, uh, but we've seen the neighboring states uh, coming in, uh, uh, Benin and Nigeria intervening uh, with with a mediation effort. We don't know how far that's going to go. We've seen the African Union and ECOWAS, the regional organization, condemning this coup. Um, so there has been, I think, much more rallying around uh, the Nigerian president than we saw perhaps in Burkina Faso or Mali, where military coups came after other military coups. Bazoum was a kind of bright spot in this region. He was a democratically elected president. He had embraced, uh, you know, Western alliances. He traveled to France, to Washington multiple times since being elected, had exchanged visits with these leaders, and so was really seen as the last uh, Sahelian leader in the Western camp. I think for him to fall and to be removed, I think, poses all kinds of questions uh, for this alliance of how we can strengthen and continue to engage uh, Sahelian states uh, going forward. Karen Hudson, we very much appreciate your insights. Thank you. Thanks.